a 747 is flying over the Pacific when suddenly a cargo door explodes. Nine passengers are sucked out of the plane. It went from a perfectly normal, calm, serene situation to absolute pandemonium. Another 747, another terrifying incident. As for 32 minutes, pilots struggle in vain to control the plane. They faced a condition that no pilot can possibly imagine, which is the airplane's no longer controllable. A 737 loses a giant chunk of fuselage mid-flight, causing a decompression so powerful it kills a flight attendant. I saw what I think was the stewardess's feet as she was being sucked out of the plane. A DC-10 loses an engine on takeoff, causing the plane to roll on its side and nosedive to the ground. The entire engine had physically separated from the aircraft. All these disasters have one thing in common. The physical structure of each plane failed with fatal consequences. What pushed these planes to the breaking point? Whenever a plane goes down, it's usually images of the tragic aftermath that are seen around the globe. Scattered wreckage, tattered clues as to what may have happened. But using dramatic animations, we can take a close-up look at these incidents and even place ourselves inside the planes, right next to passengers experiencing unimaginable terror. These are the stories of what happens when jets fail. Structural failures when part of the airplane itself fails. In the worst case, it could be something like a wing actually coming off the airplane, or a tail section, or an engine, or a cargo door. Well, the structure of the airplane is like the bones in your body, and it holds everything together. If the airplane's structure is the skeleton, then the mechanical parts inside are the internal organs. The hydraulic system provides a plane's muscle, the electrical system its brain, and the pneumatic system the breath. All these systems must be in working order for a plane to fly properly. Structural and mechanical failures can often be traced back to problems with the way planes are maintained or inspected. One example is the case of a 737 which lost part of its fuselage in mid-air on the 28th of April, 1988. One thirty p.m. Aloha Airlines Flight 243 takes off on its seventh inter-island hop of the day. The flight from Hilo to Honolulu should last just 35 minutes. But this 19-year-old Boeing 737 has a major problem. Growing cracks in its skin that are visible, yet they've gone undetected. Patricia Aubrey is sitting in row 17. We took off. Everything was normal. I always read a book when I'm flying. To fully understand what's about to happen to Aloha Flight 243, it's critical to know what an aeroplane goes through every time it flies. Think of the plane's fuselage as a balloon. Every time it goes up, the outside of the plane or the skin expands. That's from the cabin being pressurized so people can breathe at high altitudes where the air is thin. Then, when the plane comes down, the skin contracts. Every takeoff and landing, no matter how long or short the trip, is considered one cycle. And each cycle puts stress on an aeroplane, potentially causing microscopic cracks. So you have this constant pressure cycle where it expands, contracts, expands, and contracts. Over a period of time, the metal will eventually start to fatigue because of all of this expansion and contraction, just like a balloon. As the 737 climbs through 24,000 feet, the cabin pressurizes and the skin of the plane expands just as it's supposed to. But something else expands too, those cracks in the 737's fuselage. Suddenly, there's an explosive decompression. Its force is so powerful, a flight attendant is sucked out of the plane. I saw 
what I think was the stewardess's feet as she was being sucked out of the plane. Magazines, briefcases, shoes, you name it, anything that wasn't tied down was going out that hole. An 18-foot section of the plane is gone. Passengers sitting nearby can see the sky above and the ocean below. All that's holding the 737 together are the floor beams and the plane's belly structure. About two rows in front of me, I could see the floor was buckling up. The plane was bending in the middle. You can't just have a very strong piece of the bottom of the airplane without having a strong piece of the top. And so when they lost that crown, it really compromised the structural integrity. The cockpit would move in one direction, and then finally the fuselage would, would actually bend and then follow it. So it wasn't as though it was a single piece. It actually was bending. They knew they needed on the ground. Hello, 243. Can you give me your souls on board and your fuel on board? We are 85, 86 plus 5 crew members. Roger, how many do you think are injured? We have no idea. We cannot communicate with our flight attendants. OK, we'll have ambulance on the way. Miraculously, the pilots managed to land the plane. These images of Aloha Flight 243 stun people around the globe. It doesn't seem to make any difference how many times we've seen it today. It is still amazing. An airliner with its fuselage ripped away in midair, and all but one aboard survived. It happened over Hawaii. There's no bomb exploded or anything. Just poof like a balloon would explode and the top came off. I saw that the plane was falling apart up in the front, thought we were done. Earlier that year, the U.S. Federal Aviation Authority had issued a routine maintenance alert for airlines to detect and repair cracks. Aloha had not yet performed those inspections on its fleet. When a passenger reports after the accident that she had seen a crack near the cabin door as she boarded the plane, it doesn't take long for investigators to work out what's happened to the 737. It's a combination of hot and humid weather and constant takeoffs and landings. Unlike long haul flights where you take off at JFK and you fly eight hours and you land in London, that's one cycle in an eight hour period. On these island hoppers, you could fly for two hours and have 20 cycles, up and down, up and down, 30 minute cycles where you pressurize the airplane, take off, fly for 15 minutes, land, then pressurize the airplane again, so the accumulative effect of the cycling of the fuselage is greater in a short period of time than on a long haul flight where you have one pressurization cycle in an eight hour period. That was what was really not understood until this particular accident. Aloha 243 was a case where the industry began to learn the corrosive nature and how carefully it had to be monitored in a marine environment because the airplane had spent decades in and out of the Hawaiian Islands. The corrosion had expanded and it, with it cracks. The cracks began to propagate and move and they finally failed. The results were absolutely catastrophic. Coming up, the deadliest plane crash in the history of US aviation as a five-ton engine violently rips away from a DC-10 on takeoff. Pilots knew they had a very serious problem. They knew the engine had failed, but they didn't know that it had actually come off the airplane. And a night flight over the Pacific goes treacherously wrong. In one second, their fellow passengers were sitting there with magazines and drinks, and then a nanosecond later, they were gone. Aeroplane failures, whether structural or mechanical, can often be traced back to the way planes are maintained or inspected. A tragic case in point, American Airlines Flight 191, the deadliest single aeroplane crash on U.S. soil. May the 25th, 1979, the Friday of Memorial Day weekend. American Flight 191, a McDonnell Douglas DC-10, is on its way to Los Angeles with 258 passengers and 13 crew members on board. Melody Smith and Kim Jockel's parents are on the first leg of a trip to Hawaii. 
your story was my mom and dad always had a big kickoff for summer and so we normally would have been with them however they had decided about six months before that they were going to hawaii a few minutes before three p m the plane is cleared to taxi to runway thirty two right at three oh two p m it's cleared for takeoff our investigative animations are about to turn you into an eyewitness to a horrific accident the flight crew flight 191 starts their normal takeoff roll. as the airplane departs the runway on their normal climb out they get an indication that they've got an engine failure one of the dc-10's wing mounted engines has ripped away from the plane flying up and over the left wing gone with it are hydraulics and pneumatics systems critical to controlling the airplane the pilots knew they had a very serious problem they knew the engine had failed but they didn't know that it had actually come off the airplane. There's no indication for that. Look at this, look at this. Blue open engine, equipment, new equipment, blue engine. Oh. The leading edge slats, which give the wing better lift at slow speeds during takeoff and landing, are controlled hydraulically. Now, with no hydraulic power on the left side, the left slats retract back into the wing. Which means now he has less lift on that side than he has on the opposite side, so the airplane wants to roll. An eyewitness manages to snap a photo of American Airlines 191 rolled onto its side with its left wing pointing straight down to the ground. What happens next seals the fate of Flight 191. Pilots are trained to handle engine failures, and they did what their training taught them to do. They reduced their airspeed. But when they did that, they no longer had airflow across the flight controls. They did a, 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 a very good job of trying to get control of the airplane, but they just didn't have enough altitude or enough time to, to do it. The plane staggers up to 325 feet. As it's rolled onto its side and now slowed down, it is uncontrollable and goes into a nosedive. Within 31 seconds of the engine severing from the plane, the DC-10 slams into a trailer park less than a mile from the runway. The entire flight has lasted just two minutes, but it's changed these sisters' lives forever. I can remember, still remember you saying, there's no other way to tell you that there's been a really bad accident. Yeah, and mom and dad are, are dead. dead. And, I, and I said, you need to find a way to come home. There was no noise at all, and the plane just, uh, it went left wing tip right into the ground, and as soon as it hit, it had a napalm effect. It just, everything in its path was just blown into a sheet of flame. Initially, investigators are baffled. What could have caused a structural failure of this magnitude? This is all that was left of American Airlines Flight 191, as far as it got on its way to Los Angeles. They sift through the wreckage and look to the plane's two flight recorders for clues. Within days of the crash, they begin to zero in on a part called the pylon. It has a 13-inch crack they believe was caused by fatigue prior to the crash, which maintenance inspections had missed. At Evergreen International, an aeroplane maintenance and storage facility outside Tucson, Arizona, aviation consultant John Cox explains. You can see up here the pylon assembly in which the engine rests on the pylon and then is attached to the wing. It looks like an arm that's out there, hang the engine's hanging off it. That is a very complicated piece of structure. It has to be designed to take a heck of a load for the engines. Investigators also scrutinize the plane's service history, and that's when the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. It turns out not to be a design flaw. It's a troubling maintenance practice. The whole issue of that accident centered on the maintenance practice of changing an engine with this pylon attached as opposed to the more correct and approved procedure to take the engine away from the pylon while it was still attached to the airplane. To change an engine on the DC-10, the manufacturer recommended detaching the engine from the pylon, but leaving the pylon attached to the wing. At the time, engineers from several airlines were using a shortcut. They found if the engine and pylon assembly were removed in one piece, they could change an engine a lot more quickly. They would just drop 
the, the entire unit from the wing, change the component, put it all back together. In theory, it sounded great. On paper, it looked good. It's when maintenance workers are reattaching the engine and pylon eight weeks before the crash, the fatal mistake is made. If the airline had followed manufacturer requirements, workers would have simply reattached the engine to the pylon using a specialized machine recommended by the manufacturer. But because they've removed the massive engine pylon assembly together, now it has to be replaced as one unit. Using a forklift, workers inadvertently crack the top section of the pylon called the flange as they try to fit the assembly back onto the plane. Because they were using a forklift to try and hold this heavy engine up while they put these two big bolts in place to hold the, the pylon on the wing. They created a stress situation that over a period of time when the airplane was returned to service caused one of the bolts to fail. This morning investigators were out on runway 32 right at O'Hare Airport looking for a bolt about four inches long. The crack is hidden from view so it goes undetected. With every takeoff and landing cycle putting stress on the broken flange, the crack is growing and no one knows it. Eight weeks after the engine change, when Flight 191 takes off on that warm spring afternoon, suddenly, without warning, disaster. Takeoff is when this engine's producing the most thrust, when there's the most force on this pylon is during takeoff. So if it were going to fail, it makes absolutely perfect sense it would fail shortly after takeoff. As Flight 191 starts to lift off at the end of the runway, the cracked flange fails, ripping the engine away and taking with it a portion of the left wing's leading edge, which causes a loss of hydraulic fluid. As a result, the left wing slats retract, the left wing loses lift, and the rest, sadly, is history. When our parents died uh, initially, we would have all of their friends, a lot of friends, saying, well, isn't this wonderful? They all, they, they went, went together, together. And they were and so they, young. And, and, they, and they loved one another and whatever. And I can remember at the time I had to kind of choke back saying, no, I don't think this is wonderful. Seven months after the accident, the safety board issues several critical and immediate recommendations for airlines. Among them, airlines must discontinue the unapproved maintenance practice and inspect pylon attach points on all DC-10s by approved inspection methods. The safety board also recommends that airlines change their flight manuals so pilots know not to ever reduce speed in such a scenario, as in the case of Flight 191. Neither American Airlines nor McDonnell Douglas ever admitted any fault in this accident. But the two companies agreed to share the cost of settlements in more than 200 lawsuits that were filed. Every accident and incident, because of its unique characteristics, we're always going to learn something. And we have to take those lessons learned. We've got to heed those lessons, and we've got to enhance aviation safety. We don't want those people to have died in vain. Flying requires trust that all the people involved, ground crews, mechanics, pilots, are doing what they're supposed to do, and that the aeroplane itself will function normally. But for the passengers of this unlucky flight, that trust is about to be shaken when a cargo door explodes open in mid-air. In 1989, I was a practicing trial lawyer in Denver. I hadn't had a vacation in about three years. Bruce Lampert is a licensed pilot and an aviation attorney who represents plane crash victims. He never imagined he'd end up experiencing a deadly incident in the sky. I had just completed working extensively on Northwest 255, a crash in Detroit, Michigan. I was about to get started on a new case Continental 1713 in Denver, Colorado, and I had a three-week break in between those two cases. This was going to be a vacation that I would uh, uh, really remember. February the 24th, 1989, 2 a.m. United Airlines Flight 811 is en route from Honolulu to Auckland in New Zealand. 355 people are on board for the night flight over the Pacific. 
takeoff and initial climb are normal. We were settling in for, for a restful flight, and the aircraft was climbing. But as the Boeing 747 approaches 23,000 feet, the shock of a lifetime. There was uh, an explosion. Uh, everything that wasn't tied down was airborne. These dramatic animations put you next to the plane as the forward right cargo door rips open in flight, slams upward, creating a gaping hole in the fuselage, and then falls from the plane. The resulting massive depressurization sucks out two rows of seats and nine passengers. The door swung out. It's an outward opening door. And there's a stop that keeps it from going up all the way. But in flight, the air loads were such that it just kept going right through that stop and went all the way up and slammed against the fuselage above the door. And it actually fractured that, that fuselage above the door. In one second, their fellow passengers were sitting there with magazines and, and uh, drinks uh, with their reading lights on. And then a nanosecond later, they were gone. The structural integrity of the main deck has failed extensively. There's a 10 by 15 foot hole in the fuselage and debris has been sucked into both engines on that side. The inboard number three engine is pulsing fire. Number four is also failing. The pilot begins a rapid descent to an altitude where passengers can breathe normally. They declared an emergency and en route back to the airport, they had to literally shut down both the number three and number four engines. So now they're flying this big four engine aircraft on two engines. That in and of itself is a challenge for any pilot. For passengers, it's a moment of pure terror. Someone in business class manages to snap this photo as the plane is quickly descending. You know, everyone likes to think that in a stressful situation that, that, that you will act properly, you will act heroically. That you will do the right thing. But when you can do nothing, there's no place to go. There's no place to run. You can't scream because no one can hear you. So what do you do? You sit there with your hands folded in your lap and you look at the people around you. And there is very little comfort from watching others who are experiencing the same threat that you are. Then, out of nowhere, there's a sudden glimmer of hope. I remember seeing a number of the passengers on the right side pointing to the windows. And if you looked out the window, you could see there were lights. There were the lights of Honolulu. There were lights of Hawaii. And we could see land. After 20 nerve-wracking minutes, United Flight 811 touches down in Honolulu. A cheer, like a roller coaster ride, uh, and hands were thrown up above their heads as everybody uh, exclaimed their, their, their joy that the airplane had touched down. This photograph was taken during the evacuation. 346 surviving passengers and crew get off the plane fast. And people say, how in the world could everybody get off that quick? And I tell them we had a very highly motivated group of people. A grinding noise woke me up. There was a, a bang and a flash. I looked up. The whole right-hand side of the business compartment had gone. The uh, sound of the explosion, the feeling of the explosion, and the violence of the explosion is awesome. and I hope none of you have to go through it. It's a tragedy for the families of the nine passengers who don't survive, and a trauma for the rest, but at least it's over. But for investigators, the story is just beginning. They see that the cargo door is missing. What they don't know is why did it open in flight? Coming up, the cargo door is a key piece of evidence, but how will investigators find it in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Where was it? It doesn't have a beacon, it doesn't have a transponder. And more deadly crashes as planes are taken to breaking point. The airplane became less and less controllable to the point that it was no longer controllable at all. When any structural element of an aeroplane fails, the result can be fatal. 
a seven four seven has a cargo door blown out in mid-flight the decompression is so powerful it sucks two rows of seats and nine passengers out of the plane in a split second okay this is taken from row seventeen aisle c this video shot by attorney bruce lamper two weeks after the fatal accident documents the violent aftermath of united airlines flight 811 investigators immediately know the problem centers on the cargo door they can tell from the gaping hole where it used to be why did it explode open plummeting to the pacific ocean below but the key piece investigators would like to examine the cargo door itself is lost at sea with no hard evidence the safety board issues a report 14 months after the accident based on previous problems with other 747 cargo doors the report mentions a possible electrical malfunction in the cargo door locking mechanisms wreckage is falling out of the ceiling but aviation insiders recall most of the blame falling on the ground crew at honolulu airport it's one of the most interesting stories in uh, aviation accident investigation because initially it was thought that the people closing the door had not done it properly and that the door had not been sealed and latched properly. A number of employees that worked for the airline had come forward after the probable cause saying of all the individuals that work in Honolulu, this person would be the least likely to not close the door properly. He was known for being very meticulous uh, but absent any physical uh, evidence to the contrary, the NTSB is bound by facts. And the best estimate of the facts at that time said that he didn't close the door properly. Is it human error or is there another explanation? It wasn't until a year and a half later when the Navy went down and actually found the cargo door, the two pieces of the cargo door, brought them back up and they were examined that the real cause or the true cause of the event was identified. To follow the cargo door failure on United Flight 811, it's important to understand the two-step locking system that secures 747 cargo doors. First, a series of C-shaped latches electronically rotates around pins in the bottom of the door frame. Then, for further reinforcement, a handle moves L-shaped arms called locking sectors up against the C-latches to keep them in place. In addition, there are pins up and down both sides of the door. Normally, all of this holds the door shut. But in the case of United Flight 811, something goes horribly wrong. A forensic analysis of the, of the door indicated that um, there was actually a short circuit. It's an electrical problem that had caused unexpectedly a command to unlock the door um, to actually come open so that it was a, a design issue. Finding that cargo door obviously was critical to, to answering this question. It was so critical that the National Transportation Safety Board actually reissued the report with a different uh, and more up-to-date cause as well as causing all 747s to be redesigned uh, to prevent this kind of failure from occurring again. So it was a case where the industry learned a very valuable lesson. The final cause, according to the safety board, was faulty wiring that allowed the properly closed door to unlatch sometime between the closing of the door and takeoff. In other words, it happened on the ground, but the ground crew didn't do it. Before this accident, there were other documented cases of electrical problems with cargo doors on 747s. In fact, Boeing had alerted airlines to the problem, and the U.S. Federal Aviation Authority had given the airlines nearly two years to perform the $2,000 per door upgrade at the airline's expense. When United 811 took off on the 24th of February, 1989, the deadline was a year away and the problem was scheduled to be corrected by United two months after the accident. To this day, that angers passenger Dick Gutschel. There was a warning out by the FAA that that door had a problem. United chose not to correct it. That's the only thing that really bothered me because you know, I still fly United, I still like them. But they made a mistake there, they did not fix the problem when they could have fixed it.
Aviation attorney Bruce Lampert ended up representing about 40 of his fellow passengers in lawsuits against United. Without admitting any wrongdoing, the airline did settle lawsuits for millions of dollars. As I told the lawyers for United, I would much prefer getting on an airplane where nothing happens and have no cases than to be on an airplane that blows up at 23,000 feet and represent my fellow passengers. I'll make a deal with any airline I fly on. You get me there safely, and I won't represent any passenger. As we've seen, structural failure on airplanes can be caused by inadequate inspection, faulty maintenance practices, or design flaws buried deep within the guts of these giant machines. But the deadliest single plane crash in history, a 747 that crashed into a Japanese mountainside, had another cause entirely. Twelfth of August, 1985, Japan Airlines Flight 123 has a staggering 524 people on board. The plane is set to fly from Tokyo to Osaka. This workhorse of a jet makes the one-hour trip several times a day. Suzanne Bailey's boyfriend, Akihisa Yukawa, is on board. Aki was a banker. He was traveling on business that day. It was a very humid, hot Japanese summer day. From the moment that I opened my eyes that day, and, and Aki did too, um, there was a hint of, of something wrong, which I couldn't explain. Also on board, Takashi Takeda's sister, Sumiko. She did tell me that she's going to Tokyo, but I said to her, it's dangerous to fly. She told me, don't worry, brother, I've already bought a ticket. This is footage of the actual plane involved in this crash, taking off on its final ill-fated flight. 6.12 p.m., everything seems normal as JAL-123 lifts off and climbs out. But suddenly, 12 minutes into the flight, there's a problem. They were in the middle 20,000 feet, which is where airplanes experienced the most pressure on the vessel itself. At that point, they received a door warning that a door was ajar, which turned out not to be the case. An airplane's fuselage expands as the plane goes up and contracts as the plane comes down. The altitude with the greatest pressure differential between the pressurized inside of an aircraft and the unpressurized atmosphere outside is around 24,000 feet. That's where JAL-123 experiences an explosive shock. A massive decompression for reasons that they didn't know. But the crew did not realize the amount of damage they had sustained until very quickly the airplane became less and less controllable to the point that it was no longer controllable at all. That would be a nightmare scenario for a pilot. What the pilots don't know is that a critical piece of the 747 structure has cracks that have expanded to breaking point and snapped. It's the aft pressure bulkhead, an umbrella-shaped structure toward the back of the plane. It is the device that keeps the pressure in the back part of the airplane contained properly. Without that aft pressure bulkhead, you can't pressurize the tube and you wouldn't be able to breathe at 35,000 feet without the use of pressurized supplemental oxygen. The back of the airplane is getting considerable amount of stress, not only from the pressurization, but also from the tail and all the stresses of flight. So that bulkhead is very, very robust. It is a serious piece of structure. At the moment of the decompression, all the pressurized air from the cabin needs somewhere to go. It blasts back through the cracked bulkhead, and unbeknownst to the pilots, the tremendous force blows the vertical fin and other parts of the tail section right off the giant 747. Critical hydraulic lines are severed in the process. The first officer makes several radio calls that says that we're in uncontrollable flight. We do not have control of the airplane. They're fighting literally for their lives. 
airplane starts to go into what they call a fugoid or pitch oscillations up and down as well as Dutch roll the airplane starts to swing back and forth and no matter what the pilot tries to do as far as flight control inputs he's not having an effect the pilots fight desperately for control of the airplane for 32 terrifying minutes they manage to keep the plane aloft but with no hydraulics they can't control the planes up and down or side to side movement eyewitnesses on the ground later report the plane was flying like a staggering drunk as JAL 123 enters a mountainous region northwest of Tokyo the plane goes into a nosedive falling 18,000 feet a minute just before 7 p.m. JAL flight 123 drops off the radar screen it has slammed into a mountain at nearly 400 miles an hour These are the first daylight pictures from the site of what appears to be the worst single airliner crash ever. The Japan Airlines 747 went down in the mountains outside Tokyo. It is believed that all 524 people on board were killed. Coming up, investigators face the grim task of piecing together the mystery. We had a catastrophic scene. We had millions of airplane parts scattered over a mountainside. But among the wreckage, a miraculous discovery. Japan Airlines Flight 123. It is a tragedy with many clues tonight, but no hard answers yet. It takes rescuers half a day to get to the remote spot where Japan Airlines JAL Flight 123 has slammed into a mountain northwest of Tokyo. When investigators finally reach the crash site, they begin combing the wreckage for clues. Miraculously, they find something they didn't expect. Two women and two young girls have survived. The four people that survived the accident were seated in the very aft section of the airplane. So when the airplane struck the ground, the tail section broke from the main section of the fuselage and was thrown well away from the impact point. Takashi Takeda hoped his sister would be among the survivors. Sadly, as he discovered at a makeshift morgue, that was not the case. She only had a scar here on the chin. There was no damage to the rest of the body. I recognized her right away. Testimony from those who did survive will later prove valuable. But in the meantime, there are countless other clues to pursue. And we had millions of airplane parts scattered over a mountainside but the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder as well as witness statements all of these different sources of information help investigators put the puzzle together within days two important clues turn up a photograph taken by an amateur photographer as the plane passed over his village reveals the plane flying with part of its tail section missing and part of that missing tail section including the vertical fin which keeps the plane stable is fished out of a bay 100 miles away from the mountain it was quite a distance from the crash site so they knew it had departed the airplane early so now you begin to ask the question what could cause a decompression control problems and the loss of a vertical fin looking at the plane's maintenance history investigators learned there was previous damage to the aft pressure bulkhead the structure at the back of the cabin that keeps the cabin pressurized it was cracked seven years before the crash when the plane's tail accidentally dragged along the runway in an incident known as a tail strike a tail strike can occur in one of two phases of flight either on takeoff where the airplane is on the runway and is beginning its initial climb or it can occur on landing where the airplane is in a tail low nose high attitude either way it's going to create some sort of damage the repair of the cracked bulkhead is problematic the structure is so large more than 15 feet across the airplane was originally built around it to make the repair, Boeing removes the skin of the airplane around the bulkhead, replaces the bulkhead's damaged lower half, and then reinstalls the skin of the plane over it. To fuse the two bulkhead halves, Boeing's repair calls for a single splice plate or doubler. But with the skin of the plane back on, the doubler that's applied is too narrow, and an additional piece of filler is used to make up the difference. That's problem number one. 
Problem number two. The correct procedure calls for two rows of rivets to hold that doubler in place. Only one row is used. For seven years, the single row and the split up panel have been carrying twice the load they should have been. They decided to alter the ins installation procedure. It wasn't an approved procedure. The repair is certified to last 10,000 takeoff landing cycles. By the day of the crash, JAL-123 has already gone more than 12,000 cycles. The repair is inspected, but because a sealant has been used over the gap in the bulkhead, cracks developing between the rivets are not found. Unfortunately, the repair was insufficient and cracks started to develop over the service life after the airplane was returned into passenger use. There was no proper inspection procedure as well. As JAL-123 passes through 24,000 feet, cracks begin to connect between the rivets, leading the bulkhead to fail catastrophically. It's a structural failure due not to bad aeroplane design, but to a faulty repair. When we look back at structural failures, how common is it that it's repair related or maintenance related? As a maintainer, it pains me to say this, but I think we're finding more and more where it's, it's repair related. There were at least two suicides in the wake of this incident. A Japan Airlines employee who was working with victims' families and an inspection engineer who issued a certificate of airworthiness for the doomed plane after the 1978 tail strike. To this day, JAL-123 remains the deadliest single aircraft accident in the history of aviation. We've seen the disastrous results of airplanes that are not properly repaired, maintained or inspected. Japan Airlines Flight 123, American Flight 191 and Aloha Flight 243. We've also seen what can happen when a plane has a design flaw as in the case of United Flight 811. But those flights are the exception, not the rule. Every day, millions of passengers land safely. I'm asked often what's the most dangerous part about flying, and quite literally, it's the drive to the airport. But for those who survived airplane accidents, or those whose relatives didn't, statistics are of little comfort. They've seen and felt the consequences of structural failure first hand. We have manufacturers that make incredible machines, cars, elevators, airplanes, trains. And when you get on these elevators and these trains and these airplanes, you expect them to work. But once that faith in machines is shaken, you have this cynical thought. You know, the question authority bumper sticker? Well, I suggest one, qu question technology and put it on your suitcase. Survivors remember the Manchester United plane crash in Munich air disaster, I was there. Brand new next Monday at nine. Stay tuned for Crash of the Century.